we have the all-powerful God. He is the mighty God. Amen. Amen. And we worship Him today. We've come together this morning. It's good to see each other. It's good to be in fellowship with one another. It's good to sing songs and worship through music and different methods of worship. But we're not here for us, are we? We're here for Him. We're here to worship Him, to lift Him up and glorify His name. Turn to someone beside you and just say, we serve a good God and you may be seated. Today we have the honor of recognizing our high school graduates in the church today. And I'm going to ask Victoria and Caitlin if they would come at this time. This is probably their most disliked part of the process to come up front in front of everybody. But just come on up here. We'd like to get to see you and we're going to talk to you for a little bit and just get to uh, get it. Yeah, 
we have any accountants in the church that can be in the, in the field around here so you can talk to them? Can you do it? Yeah. yeah, I almost forgot that. I'm for it. Yeah. So, so Keenan, um, you've had a, a lot of things going on. I, I have, I have a, a few things that uh, I heard about. Yeah. Um, Caitlin got the music, Musical Theater Award, the President's Award for Education Excellence. She graduated in the top 10% of her class. She was also in the National Art Society, and she got the Gerb Miller Scholarship to Westminster. So, you need some good accomplishments. <laughs> we get to interact a little bit on Sunday mornings when she comes into the office and we pray before the worship service. And periodically, we hear that she come in and and she had a GPA of 8, 9, 10, or 11, something like that, you know, way up there, you know. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's a little exaggerated, a little exaggerated okay? But, um, you know, I always, I always thought that there was a four-point system, right, you know? And then I hear these people were getting like 4.2, 4.5, and whatever. So, um, I really feel dumb when we're on her. <laughs> She's so smart and you know and they both are. Look at these two examples up here in the National Art Society and, and not here anyhow, you know. But uh, but uh, we we do uh, we congratulate both of you for that. Now what, what do you plan to do? When was Miss Um I plan on going to Westminster to major in history and get a minor in secondary education and then go on to teach. Okay, we got another teacher coming up here, huh? That also has been history. That's a tough area right now, I bet you, with the, with the condition of our country and everything. It's going to be a challenge, isn't it? I would think. So you, you're going to teach the right history? <laughs> yeah. We're not going to change it and fit everybody's uh, thing. Okay, well, um, that's, that's really neat. Um, it's, been our, it's been our policy, or our, our practice, should I say, to um, gift the graduates uh, each year with a with a Bible. Um, I know they get a lot of graduation gifts. Um, Bibles may not be the top of our lists at times, but it's been our practice to try to give the graduates a Bible that they want, not just a you know we could go to the catalog and we pick out a Bible and here's a Bible and take it home and put it on a shelf and that's what happens to it. Or you can pick out the Bible you want and the version you want and the style you want and the color you want. And, and the idea behind that is kind, of, it's kind of like an ulterior motive. That if it's something you pick out, you might use, right? And that's what we want you to do. We want you not to put it on a shelf, but to, to really use it. Because I believe, and it's, it's, it's my deepest held belief, that the Word of God gets us through life. It's, it's the authority of God in our lives. We don't always like what it says. We don't always do what it says. And then myself included. But it's there to guide us. And uh, we hope that that will be your guide as you continue on. So, um, Victoria had chosen a uh, uh, New King James. Correct? I, I, I think they both are New King James, but I, 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 I forgot I couldn't check. Um, but um, uh, this is a, a personal Bible, um, another, another edition, and so we give that to you from the church, and again, hope that you will really make a practice to use it. Um, on our first anniversary, my wife and I, I, the first anniversary is paper, so I was like a big pastor and all that kind of stuff. I got her a Bible for our first anniversary. You might say, well, that, well, that was romantic. <laughs> but, no, it, but she has used that Bible all those years. And uh, if you saw her Bible today, I want to get a new one. And she would know I don't want a new one. It's, it's almost falling apart, but she's used it so much. I hope that someday I will be alive when that comes around. But I hope someday your Bible looks like that, that you use it that much. Okay? And then Caitlin, she chose the... Uh, David Jeremiah study Bible in the New King James Version. 
and uh, she looked at one of those in my office and kind of liked it, and so she has hers, and uh, this is uh, our gift to you, and again, we want you to use it and make it uh, a big part of your lives. I'm going to ask the congregation, would you stand with me, because we're going to pray for these two girls, and uh, these two ladies, should I say girls, two ladies, and pray for them as God guides them in their next steps in their lives, okay? Father God, we just thank you for Victoria and Caitlin. We thank you for their lives so far. We thank you for the testimony that they have. And we thank you, Lord, that you brought them to this milestone of their lives where they graduated from high school this week. And they move on now to further your education and entering into another phase. We pray for your protection in their schooling. We pray that you would guard their minds and help them to know that you are a central part of that. We also pray that you would help them as they have to deal with uh, some of the adult things of life and uh, getting through uh, financially and all of those things. Father, we just pray your blessing upon them. We pray these next years will be most excellent for them. And we pray again for your blessing on them. Keep them in the center of your will. Keep them close to you. Help them to grow even deeper in their faith, that they may follow you in all that they do. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Join me in congratulating Victoria and Caitlin this morning.
this morning, uh, we want to remember a couple of special requests and also the requests that are in our prayer list in the bulletin. Uh, Justin is having surgery tomorrow. We want to pray for him. And Dewey is in the hospital today and we want to pray for him. In addition to those are in our prayer list. Also, as we continue to pray for the church around the world, pray for the uh, country of Mali. Uh, pray for them, especially today as well. We pray for all persecuted Christians around the world. Join me in prayer, please. Our gracious Father, we thank you today for your presence in this place. We thank you for who you are, for how great you really are. For all of your attributes, we are so thankful that you are God, that you are the one who controls the universe. You're the one who controls all of life. And even though things happen, we can't explain. We know things happen outside of your will. We know that you've given each man and woman, child, a free will to do whatever we want to do. But we pray, Father, that you would help us, the church, the people who profess to be different from the world, help us to make the right choices. Help us to be the people who God you want us to be. We're so grateful that we can look at Victoria and Caitlin this morning as uh, examples of young people who have graduated from high school and entering into adulthood. We just pray, Father, that you would help them make good choices in their lives henceforth. We pray today that you would be with those needs we've mentioned. We pray for Justin, that you would be with him as he has surgery. We pray for Dewey, that his condition would be good, that he would meet the treatments he needs today. We pray for the others that we've been praying for, and there are some on our list, Lord, that have been in need for a long time. We pray for Rick today, I ask you to just be with him, for Michelle, touch her right now, both physically and emotionally. We pray, Father, for Gary and Rose, that you continue to be with them. We pray for Gary in a hospital, another Gary, Lord. We pray for him. And, and we pray, Father, for just each of these needs, Lord. You know them better than we do. So we pray that your will be accomplished there. We pray for the world situation today. We pray for those in the Ukraine as we tried to help in the most tangible way last week. We just pray that you would be with all that's going on there and be with the Christians who reach out to them. We pray today for our nation, our president, and his cabinet, for members of Congress, the Supreme Court, for all the tension that's going on in our country right now, Father. We pray that your protection would be there and you would be with each one in authority over us. We ask you to be their armed forces, wherever they are stationed today, and protect them. And Lord, we do pray for the church, the missionaries, the national churches around the world, and cross-culture ministry, even in our own country here. We pray for those who are being persecuted, that are examples to us because of their faith. We pray that you protect them and guide them. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for being who you are. We ask you to speak to us these next few moments as we look at your word. Help it to make an impact on our lives as your Holy Spirit speaks through the words of a, of a mere mortal. Someone who does not have all knowledge and does not have any special inspiration. But you have used men and women throughout the ages to communicate your word. But the Holy Spirit applies it to our lives. And so we pray to this end right now. In Jesus' name, amen. For the next several weeks of the summer, I'm going to be looking at different psalms. The book of psalms, uh, there's 150 of them, but there's not 150 weeks to, to take one week. So 
We're not going to be able to do that. We're going to just take a, a few of them and we're going to begin with the very first psalm, Psalm 1. And uh, follow along on the screen if you want to, or if your Bible is open and you want to follow in your own scriptures, uh, do that as well. But let's read Psalm 1 and see what it says. The psalmist writes, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff, that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. One of the keys to living a biblical Christian life is being on a firm foundation, deeply rooted in our faith. If we want to lead a biblical Christian life, and I, I'm putting that qualifier there because, you know, there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians. People will, will, will even be arrogant and say, oh, I'm a Christian. But sometimes their lives don't back it up. Sometimes we fail to demonstrate the biblical Christian lifestyle. But if we really want to do that, we need to be deeply rooted in our faith and being on a firm foundation. And that is depicted in the scripture in various ways. The psalm we just read addresses the issue by pointing out the difference between those who are blessed and those wicked in the world. The blessed are compared to a tree that is planted by streams of water. And the wicked are compared to chaff that the wind blows away. There's a contrast here. A very significant contrast. Our message today, Don't Get Blown Away, has the graduates in mind. I kept them in mind all week as I prepared, not only this week, but in, in the weeks past and leading up to this. I thought of this Sunday as a day that I could say to them, above all else, don't get blown away in life. Don't let life do that to you. But it's not just for the graduates. It's relevant to each and every one of us as we continue on our spiritual journey. And the message for you and for me, all of us gathered here today, and all who are watching by live stream and by video this morning and this week, don't get blown away. Don't get blown away. And as I look at this psalm, it's a familiar psalm, I think, that probably most of us have read it before at least once or more. One of the things we see here is that we need to be careful where we hang out. Hanging out is a difficult, difficult place to be when we're not at the right place. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 15, verse 33 of his first letter, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. How many know today that peer pressure is not limited to adolescents? <laughs> peer pressure is not limited to high schoolers. Peer pressure is not limited to the elementary schools and the middle schools of our community. Middle-agers and even Teenagers, those who are well beyond middle age, are susceptible to peer pressure. Our presence in the public arena has significance. We are in the world today. We shouldn't be of the world, but we're in the world. We can't help that. Someone once said that for a ship, to be effective, it's got to be in the water. But if the water gets in the ship, it's no longer effective. It sinks. So we need to be in the world today, and our presence 
in the public arena has significance. We have a choice whether or not we have a positive presence or if we have a negative one. And the point that we need to make today is that we have to take responsibility for our public actions. No one else is responsible. We cannot play the blame game. We cannot say that, well, I am the way I am because of the way I was raised, or I am the way I am today because my, my mother was mean to me, or I, I, I am the way that I am because I had a bad high school experience, or, or I, had a, I got fired from a job, and therefore my life turned bad, and, and it's all their fault, that that wouldn't have happened to me. Well, we can't say that. We're responsible for our actions. We are, we are responsible if we're going to go down the path of dabbling in substance abuse and getting involved in those kinds of things. If we're going to get caught up in the drama of social media, the, the stuff that's been posted on there that's destructive. If we're going to be caught up in things that we do that harm other people, it's our fault. It's our responsibility. The psalmist says we are not to walk in step with the ungodly. Now various words are used to describe the ungodly. We have words like he used here, the wicked. The wicked. The wicked are not the blessed, is what he points out in this, this psalm. Another word for wicked can be depraved. Those who are depraved. Those who are immoral. Those who are sinful, that all these words describe the contrast in people that ought not ought to be different from the way the church is, the way the blessed are. This speaks to being conformed to the thinking, to uh, conform to thinking that the way the church thinks. Paul wrote to the Romans these words that you're familiar with. He says, "Do not conform." To the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You stop and think about that for a moment. Because I'll tell you something. If I may, if I may digress from the scripture. We are living in a society where we are susceptible to being conformed to the pattern of this world. And it's, and it's infiltrated the church. It's infiltrated Christ followers. It's infiltrated people who are adapting to the world much more than we would ever hope that the, the, the church could adapt, or that the world would adapt to the church and become followers of Christ as well. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The scriptures do that job to help us be transformed. And he said, goes on to say, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. If we are renewed in our minds, we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's the role of the church. That's the role of the blessed. Paul addressed this with the Corinthians who were very characteristically caught up in some sinful things and it was a problem church and much of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians was to be corrective to them. They were, they were missing the point on so many things. And he says this in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. You, me, we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Now let me qualify that statement if I might. Because I think we've taken that out of context in some ways. Where some churches have, and some Christians have, become so separate from the world, they can't relate at all to anybody in the world. How can we ever 
influence the world for Christ if we won't associate at all? How will we ever be able to bring people to faith in Christ if we are guilty of being so separated and being so weird that nobody wants to associate with us? It happens. There are groups out there, I'm not going to mention them by name, but they, they have a reputation of being anything but Christian, but they're separate. They're different. They're cultic. People do things that just don't follow at all what Christianity is all about. We need to be separate in our behavior. We need to be separate from what the world says is okay. And today, we're living in a day and age where the world is saying things are okay that are not okay. The, the world is saying that good is evil and evil is good. It's not okay. God created man and woman, male and female. He created them. You were created whichever one you are. And I was created male. And I don't have any care at all about what I may think or someone thinks that they might be and they may be wanting to be a different one. But that's not how God created us. The world tells us it's okay. People in supposedly educated positions are taking our five and six year olds and trying to coach them into making a difference in their gender. It's not okay. So, we are to be trained not to conform to the pattern of this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are not to stand in the way that sinners take. We are not to walk and step with the world. We're not to stand in the way that they take. And this speaks to taking part in the actions of the ungodly in their worldly activities. And we don't have time to list those. You can fill in the blank however you wish of things that are going on in the world today that you know and I know and the Holy Spirit will convict us of that is sin that we don't need to be involved with because it is wrong. And he says we are not to sit in the company of the mockers. You know, if you have any awareness whatsoever about what's going on in the world today, you're going to find that there are mockers out there who are quick to mock your faith. They're quick to mock Christianity. There are a few television programs that I do not watch. <laughs> I, I'm not into the view. Some of you must be because you get the giggle there. I'm not. I'm not saying that. But but you know, if you have a traditional conservative position in this world today, they're going to mock. They're going to rip you to shreds with their mouths and their with their speech. But it's not okay. It's not okay. We are not to sit in the company of the mockers, not hanging around with those who will mock God and Christianity. Oh, I've been mocked for being a Christian. I, I had, uh, you know, jokingly people say things like, preacher boy, especially when you're in Bible college, which people say, oh, you said barber college? No Bible college. Oh, preacher boy. Yeah, you know, you come with that. And that's, that's, that's okay. There, there's, you know, people can joke. But when they mock our faith, when they mock our Christianity, and when politicians get up there and they say that we need to change our values to conform to the society in which we live, it's not okay. It's wrong. And we are not to walk 
in step with the world. We are not to stand in the way that the sinners take, and we are not to sit in the company of the mockers because this is not okay. Our priority promises to produce good results. It's what he says here in, in Psalm chapter 1. Those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his law day and night is like a tree planted by streams of water which, which, which yields fruit in the season and whose life leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. There is a positive result when we put God first in our lives. We are to delight in God's word. To delight in God's word. I don't want to belabor this point too much this morning, but again, I want to say that's why we as a church have invested a little bit in our graduates by giving them a good Bible. Because the Bible is so important in our lives. To spend time in God's Word must be a priority for a serious Christ follower. Now, that talks to everybody who's in this room today and listening outside of this for. If you are calling yourself a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a Christ follower, and you are serious about it, there is no way you can skip being in the Word of God. To spend time in God's Word every day. Every day. Oh, I know there are days we skip and days we miss and those kind of things. We have devotional booklets we pass out at church to kind of keep you on track. I know that we, it's not a legalism thing. It's not something we have to hold to legalistically, but we should want to be in the world word every day. You know what I'm going to do when I get home today? I'm going to eat. And I'll probably eat more than one time today. I'll eat tomorrow. I'll eat the next day. Why? Because that's what nourishes me. If we don't eat, we get sick and weak and all that kind of stuff. If we don't feed on the Word of God, whether it be a snack, which is okay. It's okay to take a Bible verse or a couple verses and let that be your nourishment for that day. I, I, I'm not opposed to that. Or it might be you'll spend a couple hours in the Word. You'll, you'll eat a buffet. You'll, 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 you'll gorge yourself with the Word of God. But whatever we do, it nourishes us, our spiritual lives. I just implore you today. I hope one of the things that you'll remember about me is that I, I stress being in the Word of God. Reading the Word. Having the Word in our lives every day. The psalmist says, we are like a tree that is planted by streams of water. What do we know about trees that are well water sourced? Trees that are near the nourishment. If they're not there, if there's a drought, the tree dries up, the leaves wither, the fruit does not get produced. It all goes for naught. But trees that are well water source yields fruit in season and its leaves don't wither. Likewise, you and I will be fruitful and nourished. And it says that we prosper in what we do. I don't think much of those who promote the prosperity theology that if you are a follower of Jesus, he's going to bless you with all these material goods. I, 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 I believe in logic. I, I, I think logic, things are logical. If, if you're going to consider that as being a blessing that God gives us Americans, then what is he telling all the people that weren't born in America with the privileges we have, who suffer and don't even have a meal to eat a day? What does that say about those in the Bible days 
who didn't even have a place to sleep. They followed Jesus and they went to a martyr's death because of it. If that happened in Bible days, how can we say today that we are entitled to God's blessing? Well, God does bless us, yes. But we're, we don't have entitlements to have the newest car and the, the biggest house and the largest bank accounts just because we're Christians. I don't know. And let me qualify that by saying this. If you have those things, doesn't mean you're not blessed. Doesn't mean that God is not blessing you. Does not mean that you are wrong. It just means that that's not why you have it. Because God blesses everybody in different ways. We need to be careful where we hang out and who we hang out with. The second point he says in this psalm is we need to contrast our lifestyle with the ungodly. And the problem that I see in the world today, the problem we face is that there is not too much difference in the behavior between those in the church and those in the world today. Those who study sociology and, so, and especially in Christian, uh, in, in Christian context have pointed out that the behaviors of the church are almost mimicking the, the, the behaviors of the world. There's not much difference at all. And we need to change that. We can still turn it around. We, as our individual lives, we can be change agents to say that my life is going to be led differently than the life of the world. The lives of the ungodly are not like the lives of the blessed. The psalmist points out that the wicked are like chaff that the wind blows away. Unless you're a farmer or you're involved in, in the, that kind of thing, you may, you may not be for that accustomed to chaff. But when you take the, the, the wheat and all you do, see I'm not a farmer so I can't even use the right terminology. But when you separate the kernels from everything else, there's, there's stuff that is very light. That when the wind comes, it just blows away. It just, you, you can't, it's very hard to not let it blow away. And that's like the chaff. It just, mm -hmm. That's what chaff is. That's what the wicked are like. They, they are blown away. And, and it's used throughout Scripture. The word is used throughout Scripture as an emblem of what is weak and worthless. The wicked, the ungodly, those that we're contrasting with are not rooted in doing what is right. When, when someone is described as sure, being sure-footed or grounded, it implies that they have their act together. And such is the characteristic that we should desire as Christ followers. We should have our spiritual lives together. We should get our act together in the church. We should get our act together in our Christian walk so that when we do things in the world today, when we're out there in the world, not of the world, but in the world, we ought to be seen as a little different. Reacting differently to what happens in our lives. Reacting differently to what comes against us. I would suggest this morning, if I dare travel, journey into uh, that territory, that it should not be a practice of any Christ follower to have road rage on the roads. Uh -huh. I don't know. I, I went there. I guess. You know. It's not what we should do. We should be different. The ungodly lack the strength to stand firm. James chapter 5 verse 8 says, You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. We need to stand firm. They lack stability in their maturity. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's addressing the church. He's addressing Christians and talking about us being mature and being equipped. And he says in verse 14, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves 
and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. That's the characteristic that we ought to have as the church, as the people of God. But it's not so the wicked. It's not so the ungodly because they are not grounded in those things. He concludes this psalm by saying, the wicked will not be able to stand in the final judgment. See, it often, it often appears as though the wicked prosper. This one, <clears throat> once in the psalm, he says, why do the wicked prosper? Well, why do they get away with it? Why do we see people today getting away with things? You say, where's the justice of all this? It appears many times that the wicked are the, wicked are the ones that through their deceit and through their uh, actions and things in business and shady deals, they become wealthy and filthy, wealthy, rich, and use it for the wrong things. It appears as though they prosper. It appears is of a prosper, but they won't in the end. He says they will not be able to hold up their heads. They will have no standing. I, I get a mental picture here of, of when the judgment comes, when we stand in judgment and at the great white throne, you have the wicked there and they are not going to enter the heaven. And they are standing before the judge. The picture of shame is they hang their heads. They are unable to even look at the Lord in his eyes because they have no standing. They are able to hold up their heads. They will be excluded from the congregation of the righteous. The congregation of the righteous is the church, not, not a local church, not who we are as a, a, a church located here in Mahoney Town. There are, there, are, there are churches all over Newcastle. There are churches all over the world. We, Christians, we talked about this a while back, we are the church. We are the followers of Christ. But the wicked will not be a part of that. They will not be a part of the eternal inheritance of heaven. And they will ultimately perish. The day is coming when the wicked, the ungodly, sinful. Those who do not know Christ will perish. Verse 6 says that the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Don't get blown away. Don't get blown away by life. Whether you're 18 or 80 or older, don't get blown away. The way not to get blown away is to be firmly planted in our Christian faith. To be firmly planted on the Word of God, what it says. The way of the blessed is contrast with the ungodly because Christ followers, you and I, we who claim to be Christ followers, delight in God's Word. And just like a tree that's planted by the water, we will not be moved. We will stand firm. We will be firmly planted. Don't get blown away. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word, for its message to us through your spirit today. Help us to be the church. Help us not to walk in step with the sinners. Help us not to stand in the way that they go, but and not to sit among the mockers, but the light in the word. To lead a life that demonstrates what it's like to be a follower of yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close this morning's service, would you stand as we sing? I shall not be moved just like a tree.
Jesus name. Amen. Jesus. 